So um, I'm going to back this up one slide. All right. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to hand it off. off. Well, I'm sorry. I'm going to go ahead and call the name so we can quickly introduce ourselves. And I think I think the way we've done this in the past is I'll just call out your name and we'll do the icebreaker question along with the intro at the same time. That probably makes the most sense. Um, so I guess I will hand it off to Bree because uh, she is our icebreaker person for the day. That's an official title that I just made up. It's, it's super official. Um, <laughs> icebreaker today is what is either your past favorite Halloween costume or future favorite Halloween costume if we were to do a kind of host, a, not host, but a solo or partner Halloween kind of beach cleanup costume contest of sorts. So basically, if you were to go out, pick up trash in a costume, what would that be? That's what it is. Cool. Bree, go ahead and you, since you can just use your grid to call out people's names. Oh. Um, well, I'll go first. Also, I'm Bree, beach cleanup coordinator. Um, I guess my favorite costume, I'll do the past one. Um, actually, I like the, Colleen was talking about a T-Rex outfit, um, Liz, I kind of like that idea. I like the idea of, of cleaning up trash in a T-Rex outfit. So maybe I'll have to go find one for Halloween. Um, Drew, did you already go? I did not. All right. Um, so if I were to pick up trash in a costume, I think I might dress as, well, <laughs> I was going to say um, a Star Trek character, specifically from Star Trek Discovery, um, the like alien guy um, who is the second second officer. So that's that would be my ideal in a on a beach situation because he's supposed to be kind of a mermaid guy anyhow. If anybody's a Star Trek fan, so <laughs> I like it. Um, Colleen? Hi, I'm Colleen, vice chair. Uh, let's see here. Well, I do have a favorite past costume and it was the Wonder Woman costume that my mom made for me when I was like five or six. Um, but of course, being Alaska, you didn't see it because you were bundled up in your snowsuit. So if anybody who grew up in the Northern climes understands that you only had to wear a mask. Um, but if I were to do the beach cleanup, it would definitely be my T-Rex costume or possibly go as Rey from uh, the sequels of Star Wars because she collected junk and a few other things. So that could be fun. Mm. Okay. Uh, let's see, Liz. I'm so glad I got to go after Colleen because I also am wearing my favorite costume from years ago that my mom made me, which is now like a crop top. Uh, but I wore this from the ages of like probably six to 12. It was my favorite. And so it's my dragon sweater. So uh, she got a lot of, of distance off of that crafting effort my mom did. Um, and if I were to go out on a costume cleanup now, if it was freezing cold, highly recommend a T-Rex outfit because uh, it's like wearing a giant plastic bag and it's very warm. Um, however, I think that dressing as Wally from the Wally movie would be pretty fitting. So, and I feel like I could make that costume out of trash, which I feel like is even better. Ooh. Extra points. <laughs> oh, and I'm Luke Scottman, the Washington regional manager. I'm really bad at introducing myself. I like that idea of, of somehow incorporating the trash in your outfit. Oh, look, Mike's got a Wally. Uh, call. You next. All right. Um, hello, my name's Call. Um, costume, I think there, there actually may be a cleanup tie in, but it's a past costume. I went through kind of a, a flavor flave phase. And uh, a few years in a row, actually, went as Flavor Flav, just because if it was working, and if it's working, <laughs> if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, and so, the, kind of the the keystone of that costume was actually not a clock, but a hubcap I found on the side of a road at a baseball tournament. So, kind of pieced it together that way, and uh, I think maybe I'd do that again. <laughs> I don't know, um, but. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that. Good memories. Thanks for the good icebreaker. That's good. Uh, Lydia. 
I'm Lydia. Um, I don't know why the light is so bad. Um, I was an octopus as a kid. I'd probably be an octopus again because I would have eight arms to pick up trash. And they're also my favorite animal. So yeah, one trick pony, one trick octopus. That's me. <laughs> eight like trick octopus. That is too. You're like, yeah, hey, I have more arms to pick up trash. Uh, Brian. Um, in the past, I've uh, tried to incorporate Tom Hanks. So I've done Forrest Gump and uh, cast away Tom Hanks in the same weekend. Um, but this year, maybe uh, a more disheveled look. Uh, I'll be the golf caddy from Happy Gilmore, who's just a bum uh, <laughs> wearing a bunch of disheveled clothes, picking up trash. Uh, Maddie? Hey, I'm Maddie. Um, I think my favorite past costume uh, was the blow up tube guy outside of like car dealerships. Um, that's like my spirit animal if it was an animal. Um, and then, yeah, this I live with four other people, and this year we're trying to do Scooby Doo Mystery Machine, and I'm the Mystery Machine. So, I'm excited for that. That's so cool. Uh, let's see, Mike. All right, so is my microphone working? Okay, cool. I've unplugged it this week and then I didn't know if it was still working. Uh, most memorable was I had a bit of a TV addiction and my mom dressed me up as a television when I was eight. Um, and it went over well for trick-or-treating. But uh, I think future cleanup would be left shark from the katy perry um halftime show i know where there is one it's a big chunk of money well big comparatively but i think i go with that nice uh julia hi i'm julia uh, i work as the communications chair for the chapter so i post all the social media stuff and send out the newsletter and things and i'm sorry about the typo in today's email that i sent out um anyways my favorite costume that i've been was we a rubik's cube that my dad and i made out of a big huge box that we had and for cleanup i would want to be an octopus because can make a really good octopus costume out of an umbrella and i feel like we're getting to that time of year where it probably would rain at a cleanup and i could use an umbrella or sorry jellyfish jellyfish not octopus jellyfish costume that's what i meant i know what I, I know my uh sea creatures very well yeah <laughs> nice uh gus are you there okay uh, uh i'm muted now can you hear me Yep. Sweet. Um, yeah. So, uh, sorry about that. I was shoving some food in my face. Um, my, I'm Gus. I'm the Washington policy manager, um, the second of two staff that works with all of our chapters around the state. Um, my favorite costume from the past uh, definitely would have been a 70s basketball player back when I had the really big fro um, back in college days, and it was a bartender. Uh, a lot of fun, and um, I'm still on the hunt for the perfect Sasquatch costume, although Liz informs me that I've got the, the face and the hair going uh, pretty good here, so uh, maybe I'll just kind of roll with that and figure something out for down below, so yeah, looking forward to it. We're all about Halloween in my house. I got a four-year-old, and uh, so we're definitely going to be partying. Just get, uh, Gus, just get a uh, Chewbacca costume and get rid of the bandolier thing and you could do it that way. That should work some. Dye it. You could dye it brown. Darker brown. <laughs> no, I can find one. I might have a connection or two. Uh, okay. I believe the internet might hold the answers. Well, it, it does. I've looked. But I was going to say, I might know some people at the 500 first that I could probably see if I could, um, somebody might want to donate an old one or something. I'll, there you go. I'll, I'll, I'll a used Squatch costume. That's even better. <laughs> and most unique connection I've ever heard of. So. 
That's right. Yeah, by the way, I'm, a, I'm also the resident nerd, dork. Dorkaramus Rex is my other thing, so yeah. <laughs> uh, Chelsea. Hi all, sorry I'm um, driving right now, so I'm not on camera, but I'm the Ocean Friendly Restaurants Coordinator for Surf Rider. And my favorite costume was a group costume in college. We went as Candyland and it was very fun. Um, and I think if I would dress up for a beach cleanup, I would be a bumblebee because I have the ears already. And I was gonna do that last year, but I was sick. And so I didn't get to wear the costume. And also my cat's name is Bee. So it's kind of a cute um, co-costume <laughs> with her, I guess. Awesome, these are good. Thanks guys. But he said Oscar the Grouch, I'm impressed. <laughs> Drew, go ahead. I think that's everybody. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, all right, everyone, thanks. Uh, hope that, hopefully that was a little bit of fun. Um, so I think we're gonna move forward with uh, our chapter updates. Does the screen I'm sharing, does it look weird? Like, <laughs> are you seeing part of another screen? All right, fixed it, sorry. Um, so a couple chapter updates um, to go through today, um, and I'm going to let um, Carl or Liz uh, expand on this a little bit, but we are in a period where we're going to be having um, executive committee elections coming up uh, before the end of the year for our 2021 um, executive committee. We don't have exactly what uh, positions might be opening up as of yet. Um, we do need, know that we'll be looking for a new uh, social slash communications chair um, as part of this process and potentially a few other positions. Um, so I think one of the things that, you know, obviously we'll be announcing this to the membership um, via our email letter as well, um, but we wanted to announce it first to the folks who join us regularly on these meetings. Um, and again, if, if anyone is interested in joining and becoming part of that, you know, obviously reach out to any of us. Um, we can give you some more information about what we do, what the positions are, those kind of things. And um, like I said, there will be additional announcements about sort of what might be opening up and um, additional steps on how to participate in those elections if in case, in case you want to do so. Um, and that does bring me to the second bullet point on here, which I will let Colleen talk about in a moment, but um, we are encouraging everyone to be a member because you do need to be a member to be part of the executive committee. Um, but I will let, if, if Liz or, or uh, Carl, if you have anything to add to this, um, go ahead. Um, cool, thank you, Drew. Um, I, I will just kind of throw in a, a quick word. Um, as, as most folks probably know, the, the vast majority of the EC was elected into the current roles earlier this year. Um, so we do have a little bit of a staggered kind of election cycle, which is, as far as I know is, is totally fine. I think actually great um, so that we have roles kind of flipping over at, at different times. Um, and, you know, I guess the other, the other thing I just like to throw out there is, is huge credit to our current executive committee um, for, you know, pulling through a, a pretty wild time the last six months. And I know we probably say this every meeting, but even that is, is not enough and does not do justice for, for what this group has, has pulled together. Um, I think Liz can attest having worked for, with a lot of different chapters over the last six months, I think we're, you know, kind of a standout, which is really special and credit to, to everyone on the EC and, and everyone who's not on the EC too and, and showing up to these. And um, it is quite a bit of work pulling these meetings together, especially when we have guests and, and films and some of the other stuff we've, we've, we've pulled off. So thank you all so much for, for making this fun and, and uh, really buckling down at, at, at a key time. Um, I mean, I, I will say my, my, term as chair is up uh, next month. Um, so that's, that's something that's, that's going to be up for discussion and um, I'll have more to say next meeting, but um, I think officially we do need to just get that out there. Um, 
and and so you know lots of opportunities on the EC you know whether there's um, something that that looks like a fit as is or if there's some sort of hybrid um, you know we're obviously flexible and and really just looking for for personalities that that can kind of keep pushing this thing um, so it's it's been a joy to be a part of and uh, hope others will consider um, joining as well um, I think that's that's all I got I'm not sure Liz if there's any other kind of official um, things that need to be said or, or touched on but um, I, I think next next meeting we're, we'll plan on having an, an official election and um, and uh, you know get, getting a, a new EC which will probably look a lot like the the current one hopefully um, going into next year Right on. Yeah, I just wanted to second like how impressive you guys have all been. Like it's been such an inspiring and energizing uh, group to work with. And so I'm just super stoked that you're all here and part of the EC um, and all of you who are joining for our chapter meetings, especially those of you regulars, because it's always great to see faces that become familiar, um, especially in these isolating times. So and I also just want to thank Paul for his leadership because he's definitely been fundamental and and the progress that this chapter has made in a crazy year, um, despite all odds, you guys are killing it. And so just want to, you know, throw some, some love his way. Um, <clears throat> in case you guys are wondering, so like ECs, to be an EC member, um, you have to be voted in and it's typically a two-year commitment. Um, and the hourly, like the monthly requirements can be pretty minimal. Like some people only put like a few hours in a month and other roles, as many of you um, currently on the EC know, it can be a lot more. Um, and so you can kind of make the roles kind of what you, what fits you and what skills you either want to utilize or develop. Um, one of the benefits is that as part of Surfrider, you get access to a ton of resources, um, a bunch of trainings and leadership development. Um, we do a lot of media communications and we have partners that, that lead workshops on everything from how to design media um, like graphic media and data visualization to working with legislators. And right now, instead of our annual conference, um, Surfrider is hosting like a ton of virtual trainings um, throughout the next couple months. And so you get access to these really cool opportunities to, to grow and learn, as well as just an awesome network of human beings that you can tap into, um, which can be really useful if you're traveling, uh, not to throw it out there and rent out my fellow surfrider's couches, but it's a great community to be in touch with because you can go um, almost any coastal city and like find some surfriders and they're always open and welcoming um, and they can tell you where the secret surf spots are. So, um, so yeah, it's just a great community to be in. Um, don't be intimidated if you don't have any experience and you want to learn or if you have a special skill set. Um, and I also just want to mention that you don't have to actually be officially on the EC to participate in the monthly EC meetings. And so behind the scenes, when we're organizing and hosting these monthly open public chapter meetings like today, usually there's at least one other EC meeting, um, usually a week or two before or after a chapter meeting where the planning and implementation part kind of goes on in the background. Um, so if you have ideas for cool projects or focuses or partnerships that you think this chapter could benefit from, um, we are always open and willing to hear, and you're always willing to sit in on our EC meetings to just see what, what they look like and what we talk about um, and things like that. So if you have any interest, I definitely encourage you to, to check it out and reach out to your chapter. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I had to say. Cool. Thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, we have a few other, I'll touch on a few other sort of just general volunteer opportunities a little later in, in our, uh, you know, <laughs> A formal word program today. <laughs> um, but what I will say also is, you know, obviously my role is a treasurer, but, you know, I'm consistently the host of our chapter meeting. So it is what you make it. And, and that's one of the things that I always tell people who ask me about what I do with um, Surfrider is that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in, in whether it's EC or just a general volunteer or, or you so have a passion about something, there is a lot of opportunity to make it your own um, under the umbrella. So um, again, reach out to us if you have any questions, any thoughts, just want to talk about what it is that we do, that kind of stuff. Um, appreciate it. Um, all right. Uh, I guess we can, oh, uh, <laughs> in the last bit of this, um, Colleen, 
would you like to do a little uh, plug? Sure. As we mentioned, one of the things that you need to do to be part of the EC is be a member. So what does that mean? Um, some of you have seen, you know, the emails that come through either from our general chapter or from our headquarters and things like that. But really what it is, is there's two ways to be a member. You can be a general member, which I used to do way back when, before I got myself fully involved and I was living in cities that didn't have, um, you know, Surfrider chapter. So you send your $25 off to um, HQ and whatnot. But one of the things that we want to encourage is you to give, you know, your membership dollars to the Seattle chapter. Why? Well, it's going to A, be the best $25 you'll ever spend, and it doesn't go to Jeff Bezos. Second of all, it supports all our local chapter activities. So anytime we host our beach cleanups or we have um, International Surfing Day or we do these types of partnerships, we have funds that we can draw on to make it a great opportunity for everybody to show up. Um, I'm going to put in the chat box the link to our... Um, that link that's in the um, on the dem the, on the slide deck there, that's the link to go to our uh, website that will donate the money straight to. You can donate on a one-time basis, a monthly basis, an annual basis. You can set it up for recurring, so you don't have to think about it ever again. You need a few extra miles to get yourself to that platinum status on Alaska or United or Delta or whatever. This is a great opportunity to do that too. Um, if you think that you had a membership but it may have expired. Let us know. Um, definitely email the treasurer email address because they'll, um, he, Drew will have the uh, roster. Um, I, I may have still have access to that, Drew. I was the former chair. That's, or uh, no, not, not the former chair. Hello. Former treasurer. Huh. It's been a week. Um, <laughs> yes, I know it's only Tuesday. So, anyways, um, yeah, it's really great. We really welcome it. And of course, you know, if you want to be part of the EC, you do need to be a member. They do check on that, believe it or not. Um, so there you go. That's all I have to say about that right now. And Drew, the reason why you're always hosting it is you are the host with the most, man. I mean, come on. <laughs> so anyways. So yeah, if you guys have any questions about uh, memberships, you can email Drew at the treasurer. You can email me at the vice chair. Um, be more than happy to chat with you guys about any of that. So thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Colleen. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's totally appreciate that. And if you know anyone that you can encourage to be a member, um, that would be great as well. And, and Drew, just, just one more kind of plug for membership. I think another thing, you know, something that really clicked for me about the importance of membership was, um, you know, going to, to DC and to Olympia and, mm -hmm. and it, it really, I mean, that membership number is really, I, I think where that, the, the value of that, you know, 25 bucks, it's like, if we're going, you know, to our representative and saying, we're here on behalf of, you know, 500 people in Seattle that care enough about, you know, the environment and clean water and clean air to, to pay 25 bucks, you know, and join Surfrider as a member, that is a much more powerful message than saying, you know, a hundred people or something. Um, so that, 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 that membership piece, in addition to, you know, being a part of it and, and supporting the programs and everything that Surfrider does, that, that membership number is also um, key. So yeah. it's something to keep in mind. Um, it, it is, it's the, it's the power that we wield and can wield um, in, you know, in my mind. And, you know, that said too, I think one of the things that just you know, as we're talking about getting involved as EC or even, you know, a at a volunteer, we do have opportunities for, um, we went to Environmental Action Day at, uh, at, at, at in Olympia. Um, I went along with Carl and Colleen and got to have a time where we met with our, our reps and, and, and Senator um, about specific issues. And just that experience alone um, to me was, was, is worth, the just being part of the group. So, you know, you learn a lot about activism, you learn a lot about how the legislature actually works. Um, and it actually has helped me really be involved in sort of making informed decisions about even upcoming elections. I learned a lot just by being part of that process about what I'm doing right now. So, um, many benefits and many places where you can definitely take what you want from it too. Um, 
Cool. Uh, well, thanks, Carl, for pointing that out. Um, and I think from there, we've got a little seabed mining uh, update from, from Liz. Do you need control of the screen, Liz? Yeah, I can control. Right. Let me see if I can share my screen first. No. Yeah. All right. I think you can just make me a co-host and that should work. And then I will let all of the power go to my head. You are now co-host. Right on. Let me uh, make sure all my inappropriate tabs are clear. Just, okay. um, just share just the application, not your entire desktop. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I've, there's been too many times I've seen browser histories that I didn't need to see. <laughs> mine are all nerd things, so it's just like weird. I didn't say mine weren't nerd things. It's others that I'm just like, oh, that combo shouldn't happen. No. All right. So are you guys seeing the slide for seabed mining? Is it coming up? Yes. All right. Sweet. Great all right. So, <laughs> yes. Um, so again, my name is Liz Scottman. I'm the other of two staff in addition to Gus. I'm the Washington Regional Manager. Um, and so I'm going to talk about seabed mining, um, sort of go over what it is, how it's done, um, the potential effects and consequences of it to our coast here in Washington, uh, and what we here are doing about it. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that a lot of the resources and content and imagery that I'll be sharing with you today um, came from Pew Charitable Trusts, who are one of our strong partners in this effort. Um, and so I do want to acknowledge uh, their contributions. Do, 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 do. All right, so what is seabed mining? It is the extraction of minerals and metals from the sea floor. Um, so I do want to distinguish that from um, what's called sand, gravel, and shell mining, which is basically dredging like sand for things like beach renourishment. So what I'm going to be discussing today is more in, in specific to industrial scale extraction of like hard minerals um, from the sea floor. Um, we do have some like artisanal mining in Washington for like people who do like recreational gold hunting and, and things like that. I'm not going to be talking about that. I'm talking about industrial scale mining of um, the sea floor. So there's three main types of mining that we usually refer to when we're talking about this. Um, they, there are three different sources, three different mixes of resources um, in these different forms and slightly different ways that we would go about extracting them with different um, environmental consequences associated with them. Um, so the first one are manganese nodules. And so these are like potato sized lumps that are just sitting on the seafloor on what's called the abyssal plain. So just these broad flat areas out in the open ocean. Um, and these manganese nodules typically contain things like copper and nickel, cobalt, and um, importantly, lithium. So any of your lithium batteries need lithium. And that's some of the largest sources on earth that we know of are in the deep sea. Um, the other type, oh, and so they just sit there. And so to extract them, you just kind of pluck them off the seafloor, which seems kind of benign and not very invasive. Um, but there actually are some pretty destructive consequences associated with it, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the other, another form are called the cobalt rich crusts or ferromanganese crusts. And these are located on seamounts, which are underwater mountains. Um, and seamounts are completely critical for marine biodiversity because all the cold, oxygen rich, nutrient dense water at the sea floor, when the currents are pushing them around and it hits our coasts or seamount, that water gets pushed up to the surface. And so it's just these bio, it's like an oasis in the open ocean. Um, so they're critical for a lot of fisheries and marine biodiversity because it attracts a lot of cool megafauna like sharks and whales and sea turtles and stuff. Um, and so these crusts contain a lot of cobalt and manganese and other really important metals. Um, and then we have a seafloor massive sulfides, SMSs. So these are accrete, like they accrete around hydrothermal vents, um, which are these deep sea phenomena that we haven't really, we don't really know a lot about yet because they're fairly recently discovered on the spectrum of you know, biodiversity hotspots. Um, but <clears throat> they're really cool because they're these unique ecosystems that have evolved without sunlight. So all the life that we know of and interact with on a daily basis derives that's energy from the sun, like all the plants we eat and our pets and our lives, it's all photosynthetically derived. Um, but these deep floor ecosystems are chemosynthetic. So none of their energy comes from the sun. It all comes from the core of the earth and all the heat and uh, minerals that come out of these little hot spots. 
Um, and so in order to harvest these, you have to topple these towers over and smash them apart and then sort of suck them up to the surface and process them. Um, and I do want to say the cobalt rich crusts, you can see that it's just a thick crust. And so in order to extract it, you basically have to like plow this off and it's sort of like mountaintop removal um, underwater. So it's also obviously very destructive. Um, and so why is this an issue that we're talking about now? So global industries kind of have their, they've had their eye on, like we've known that these resources are down there for a while. We don't fully know the extent because it's just really expensive and hard to study and map the deep sea. Uh, but we've known they've been down there and the idea of harvesting them have been, has been around for decades. Um, but it's only until like recently that it's become sort of financially feasible and there's a number of different factors. So one is like, we've just been mining the earth for a while and so we're starting to deplete those terrestrial sources. And so we're running out at the same time as we are experiencing a huge uptick in demand for these resources because a lot of it is driven by the green technology revolution that we're kind of experiencing right now. Um, so wind turbines, all of your electronic batteries and tablets and phones that, you've that use lithium ion batteries, LEDs, um, car electric car batteries, like all of these resources and technologies require these minerals and metals. And so demand has just continued to increase and is projected to continue to like kind of ex exponentially ramp up as time goes on. Um, and on top of that, just improving technology and our ability to get down there and extract these resources has sort of combined into this perfect storm um, to where it's like becoming a financial reality. Like we're to a point now where this, this could start happening on a wide scale in our oceans. Um, it hasn't yet. It, there's only a few locations in the world where they've even tried, you know, starting this, this process. Um, and a lot of what we're going to be a lot of the deep sea resources are in are beyond the exclusive economic zone. And so most of what we're going to be focusing on is in Washington state waters, which is in three miles of shore. Um, but then the ex our economic zone is within 200 miles of shore. And a lot of these resources are located out in the high seas. And so they're under different kind of complex international regulations that are still being evolved and developed today. Um, but we're going to be focusing in Washington state waters. So what are the effects of mining? So obviously terrestrial mining we're familiar with, it's got some pretty horrible consequences. Um, the physical damage at the extraction site is obviously pretty, pretty devastating for these ecosystems. If you think about the deep sea, these are cold, dark, quiet places that evolve very slowly and operate on a very slow time scale. And so when you get all these industrial machines down there with their bright lights and their loud noises, they, they're just a huge disturbance in a system that has not evolved to deal with a lot of disturbances. Um, so in addition to noise pollution, which can interfere with uh, marine organisms communicating with each other. So for example, our orcas have to communicate and like even with just boat noise that goes on in, our, in the Puget Sound, they kind of have to scream at each other in order to coordinate like their hunts and stuff. And so we don't want to increase the noise pollution because noise travels an incredibly far distance underwater. Um, light pollution is another big issue. We don't know really a lot of what would happen if we started lighting up the deep sea, but these, these organisms evolved in darkness. And so that will definitely disturb them in ways that we don't fully understand. Um, there's also thermal pollution. And so we're sucking up all these resources from the deep cold depths bringing them up to the surface, which is going to be a lot warmer with my wings. Yeah, um, sorry. And processing them. And then we inject that warmer water back down into the water column, um, potentially jacking up the temperature in these ecosystems very quickly. Um, and so that's also another potential negative effect that we fully don't understand yet. Um, conflict with, with other industries. So for example, obviously fisheries are going to be um, at risk, especially on places like seamounts that are incredibly biodiverse and important to our commercial fisheries. Um, and then the subsequent la loss of biodiversity and habitat at the extraction sites. But one of the biggest issues that we anticipate is with the sediment plumes. And so when you're extracting resources from the seabed, you have two different plumes you have to deal with. You have the extraction site plume at the bottom, which is going to have more concentrated effects and sort of bury surrounding habitat with sediments. Um, and then as you process all these things, you have to 
you know, nobody wants to carry a boatload of dirty water back to shore with them. You want to concentrate all your resources and get rid of that dirty processing water, basically, which is going to be laced with things like metals and potentially, you know, toxic, chem you know, minerals and elements in them. And so the dewatering plume has to be injected somewhere back in the water column. And we don't really know what the effects of that will be, but it probably won't be great. Um, a lot of the carbon dynamics in the ocean are driven by microbes. And we don't know how these microbes are going to react and be affected by these sediment plumes. Um, and also a lot of the base of the marine ecosystem is filter feeders. And so if we're spraying a bunch of toxic sediment out into the water column, these filter feeders are going to be impacted with consequences that lead up the food chain. Um, and these consequences will probably last a lifetime. Um, so this is an image 30 years after um, one of the long-term experiments that happened, they did an experimental plow of like 11 square kilometers on the seafloor. It's called the Diskel experiment. Um, and that plow mark is still visible 30 years today, like, like nothing's changed. And so these ecosystems operate at such a slow pace that whatever we do to them is basically going to be irreversible in the timescales that we think about. Um, and so it's incredibly important that both globally and locally at our state level, we get ahead of these industries. And so we truly understand what the effects are. Um, so there are my, hmm, my, uh, my, my images aren't popping up, but I had a map. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the map, but currently there are no specific regulations about seabed mining in Washington state. Oregon banned it like decades ago in the nineties. Um, and so there's no reason we can't do the same here. Um, and so that's why we here at Surfrider, Pew Charitable Trusts, and some other partners are working to ban uh, seabed mining in our state waters because those nearshore waters are going to be the most vulnerable. Um, they're obviously the most important for recreation and a lot of coastal fisheries. Um, and so we want to focus on those as a first step to protecting our state from this extractive process. Um, and we're obviously going to have to engage our state agencies as well. DNR is responsible for leasing our aquatic lands. Um, but D, uh, Washington Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Ecology are all going to have to play a part in this um, because they all regulate different aspects of our environment that are going to be impacted by this industry. Oh, there it is. There's the map. Um, and so you guys can see these tiny green dots. Um, those are known sites with resources that could be mined. Um, a lot of these you can see are located in the Olympic Marine um, National Marine Sanctuary. So there are some protections, but you can also see that a lot of them are in our state waters um, and not in any location where they have any sort of protections or regulations in place. And so we want to get ahead of that. Um, and then there's also, I just learned that there's some black sands in Grays Harbor. I'm not fully aware of like what black sands are, but they're again, they're a resource where there are these minerals are, are contained within these black sands that we would basically dredge up um, and then, you know, extract those resources. And that's in Grays Harbor. So we obviously don't want these sediment plumes where like our shellfish industry is located for obvious reasons. Um, all right, so solutions. So there are a lot of things that you can do to promote this kind of um, ocean protection effort. Obviously supporting organizations like Surf Rider Foundation, <clears throat> become a member, um, and or Pew Charitable Trusts and other organizations that work on coastal preservation. Um, supporting those organizations does a lot because we're out there trying to get this work done. Um, on a personal level, you can reduce or use recycle. Like the fewer products we consume, the less there, the demand for those resources to make those products is. And so if we all just waited, you know, a couple years to get that next iPhone, you know, that, that demand sort of decreases. And so saying no to, to needless and excessive consumerism is a huge step towards sustainability in every direction, um, in every aspect, not just seabed mining. Um, promoting a circular economy, the cool thing about, there, so there's, there's arguments over whether or not the terrestrial sources of these materials will sustain the, the projected demand for them. Um, I don't pretend to know the answer to what's out there, but there are experts that say, if we implement better recycling and more um, a circular economy, in addition to the terrestrial sources that are already out there, we can supply the demand that is out there. There's others who argue that we don't have a choice, we need to go to the ocean depths. Um, but the cool thing about metal is that it's infinitely recyclable. 
plastic, you can only recycle it like once or twice, if that, and it degrades versus metal. If you build your, your products such that they are designed to be recycled and those materials extracted, you can just keep using them pretty much infinitely. And so there is hope that at least with these kinds of products, we can redesign them and implement systems to collect those resources. So we don't need to go and destroy our seafloors uh, to get them. And finally, what we're doing, um, a specific action you can take right now is if you have a business that you operate or know somebody who operates a business, we are currently petitioning um, businesses in Washington to sign our letter, um, which we will collect these signatures and provide to Governor Inslee um, to promote a ban in, to, of seabed mining in Washington state waters. And so that'll be our first step. Um, obviously, there are a lot of sources in federal waters that you know, we will you know, keep an eye on as, as this industry progresses. But step one is just keep it out of our state waters. And so um, if you go to our website, um, WashingtonSurfRider.org, <clears throat> we have a blog post that has a lot of this information and more and some cool videos on how seabed mining goes down. Um, and you can find a link to our business sign-on letter, um, which I think I can pull up here. But yeah, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. You can just add your name, business, address, city, state, zip. Um, and that will tell you, um, oh, excuse me, that will add your name to the list. And I think that is it. Yeah. So thank you guys. And I'm open to questions. I'm going to show you this really cool manganese nodule. Again, this pew provided a lot of these images. So I just wanted to give them a shout out for that. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Cool. Thanks, Liz. Um, if anyone has some questions, now was a good time. Well, I don't have a question, but um, I can chime in and just say thank you so much, Liz, uh, for that great presentation and all of your energy and enthusiasm you're bringing to this effort. Um, you know, it's kind of a new campaign that we're working on, but uh, it's exciting. And um, just a couple of things from my end to add to it. Um, I've been having some conversations with state legislators and we're in the early process of drafting some potential legislation to close the door on this uh, for Washington's territorial seat. We're also, uh, some of our colleagues down in California are working on some really similar er efforts down there. So between California, Oregon's existing ban, and if we can get Washington as well, uh, that would really send a strong message that our nearshore state waters are very sensitive for a variety of different uses that our coastal communities depend on. And it's, this is not an activity that we want to see happening off of the West Coast uh, in this sensitive environment for all the things that we care about that support our, our economy and our well being. So, <clears throat> thank you, Liz. Liz, I have a quick question for yeah. you. Um, Bring it. Our um, proximity to, say, Canada. Do we have, I mean, given that's an international aspect and you know, you can just drive 45 minutes north of Seattle and I can see Canada from my backyard kind of thing. So where are we, you know, do we have anything in line to possibly create a Washington, say British Columbia type um, communication on how to start that conversation? Because, you know, the waters don't know where the lines are. And so where, you know, have we started, you know, like what's on the horizon for that? That, I'm sorry, I thought I was on mute still. That is an excellent question. And so the problem with like international, so there's there's a body called the International Seabed Authority that manages a lot of the high seas and the area below the high seas is actually just called the area, lack of creativity there. So anything outside of a country's exclusive economic zone is managed in this sort of complex international, um, still being developed, regulatory body called the International Seabed Authority. Um, and so I don't really know where that is right now. I believe they just sort of updated some of the regulations or in the process of releasing those updates like this year. Um, and so I can't say where they're at. I do know that, I don't know where Canada's regulations are. Actually, that's a great question that I should look up. I do know that there is a Canadian company that is targeting our area that is like, leading in the chart, you know, they're, they're investigating and exploring and 
um, I think trying to get some leases um, to start exploring with the potential for extraction. So I don't I want to say it's called, I forget what the company is called, but I know there is a Canadian company that is looking to start seabed mining um, soonish, but I don't know what Canada's regulations are. So that's a good point. I, I can add to that just a little bit. I know that it is on Canada's radar screen and it's something that they're very concerned about, um, especially, you know, around some of the, the seamounts that are off of um, Vancouver Island and, and further out in deeper waters. It, it actually was some articles that I first read uh, maybe a year or two ago from uh, Canadian media sources that were kind of highlighting this in relation to some of Canada's marine protected areas and some of their marine spatial planning efforts that they have going on and um, concern about whether or not some of those management measures were actually going to protect from those potential uses if they were to actually go forward. So yeah, that is a really great question, Colleen. Thanks, I appreciate it. Cool, well, if there's no other questions, um, first of all, thank you, Liz. That's uh, very informative on a topic that I don't think gets <laughs> a lot of attention. Um, and Gus, thanks for the kind of real-time updates on, on some of the talks that are happening. That's, that's obviously really appreciated. And it's nice to know that there is that stuff going on um, in real time. So yeah, obviously good, good info. Um, if there are any other questions, speak up now. Otherwise, I'm going to move on. Um, we really only have uh, sort of one other topic. We were just going to expose um, a few of the volunteer opportunities that we're currently um, looking for. And this kind of goes along. Obviously, we still have, you know, we have the EC that we talked about earlier. Um, and we've got a few things that we are also sort of looking for from specific volunteers for specific things. Um, first up, I'll tell you, we are planning a surf rider film screening series. Um, and this will be in conjunction with the Olympia chapter to start out. Um, but we're obviously looking for folks to help us plan, give us film ideas, um, you know, things like from, from as simple as uh, chasing down permits to screen these things to a group, um, to helping us host or find, you know, panelists to help us talk about whatever the topic might be for the evening. Um, so that's kind of one thing that's floating out there. And of course, anyone, please just stop me, ask questions if you have an, an anything uh, at any point during any of this. And um, also keep on a lookout for some of these. We're gonna be um, sending out more info and then we'd love you all to attend um, some of these screenings and they're gonna be accompanied with some pretty cool discussions, I think. Um, oops, not quite yet. <laughs> There are a few other uh, volunteer opportunities that I, I did want to talk about. Obviously, we've talked a little bit about the fact that we um, we will we'll be looking for a new communications and social media chair. Um, but in that vein, we're also looking for you know folks who can help us even just write you know one help us write one newsletter a month or um, with any way that you can help out with the social media or communications. Um, we'd be willing to entertain and have have a conversation with how we could fit you in that would be great um julia do you have any other things to say about that yeah uh i really like being the communications chair i'm just moving to australia in march so uh i need i can't take this position with me while i'm moving um so yeah if anyone i us yeah so if anyone is interested in helping with communications like on the social media side and or in the newsletter uh, just send me an email or you can also just send me a message on one of the social media platforms um, because I it is a little bit of an intensive role in that like it's not actually that much because I spend a lot of time already on social media but it like just a what to post and kind of collecting things together so if it's something that interests you uh, just let me know and then we can kind of do like a transition thing just because I want to make sure you're supported because I was thrown into it and was like ah and I don't want you to have that same experience. <laughs> yeah, and, and we, we realize as a group that I think this role needs, we need 
a leader type of role and also some support for it too. So that's one of the things that we'll be talking about a little bit further as we move, move forward. Yeah, and if you have just like cute posts that you think you're like, man, I made this really adorable dolphin gif thing that you should post, <laughs> like feel free to send those over to me and we can get them posted. Yeah. That would be cool. Cool, thank you, Julia. Um, so the last thing I wanted to mention is, um, you know, more uh, the other, it's more of a planning organizing thing. Um, we're, getting, we're going to be doing a more um, expanded volunteer training coming up in January. We're just starting to plan it, um, but we are looking for people who might help us with the planning stages, um, help us with the promoting stages, um, and those kind of things. So, so that's really um, the main, the, the sort of specific volunteer opportunities that, you know, we've identified at the moment. And otherwise, I think, you know, as we've mentioned before, there's multiple ways to plug in with us, and um, we want to hear from you on all of that stuff. Uh, let me stop sharing the screen. Um, and I think that's about it for the, uh, the, the program that we've um, planned for this evening. Um, if anyone else out there has any other topics, um, feel free to, to launch into it now. Oh, can I make uh, one comment, Drew? Like, if you see something that needs to be improved or you're like, wow, I think this would be like a really great like video thing for surf rider host i'd love to do that or whatever like don't be afraid to like say like yeah i want to take that on even if you're not on the ec like you should feel empowered to always uh add whatever you want to add to like because it, it, it's your chapter like we it's here for you but you also can make it better if you if you have something that you want to do yeah absolutely yeah cool um so I think at this point, we just, again, it's just open discussion. If anyone has any questions, um, we can hang out here for a few moments. I don't know if um, Carl or Liz or Gus have any final things to say either. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll throw something in there. Um, Liz was talking about kind of the community around Surfrider and um, I just wanted to share a recent story. I've, I've been on the road the last few weeks and, uh, met um, some folks actually in Washington, D.C. Um, from all over the place, but ended up connecting and hanging out quite a bit with um, a group of folks from Charleston, from the Surfrider chapter down in Charleston. Um, totally badass group of women. They were so much fun, um, but we've been in touch and they're like totally fired up about Surfrider. And I was passing through and uh, just kind of reached out on a whim and ended up hanging out with them for a couple of days and um, going surfing. It was fantastic. And then they sent me with these that they got made up, which is like their kind of big swag thing. And I thought um, they were really cool. Um, so um, I need like five pairs of those so I can finish my Christmas shopping now. Exactly. Socks, socks are such They're a good socks. idea, right? I mean, it's like everybody <laughs> needs socks. Um, so yeah, that, the, that story kind of has two parts. One is like the community thing is real. That's not just a cliche. It's like, I stayed with these people, you know, in their apartment for a couple days and surfed. And I mean, it was just such a blast. Um, but then the other thing is like socks. If, <laughs> <laughs> if we're going to try to do something, um, I don't know. I mean, we've all got a lot of t-shirts and stuff, but socks especially in the northwest especially in the fall i have a request that you do like a like you're you're going out you make like a little video of like sock puppets discussing like the importance of community engagement and like why mm. you're going surf rider i think that would be that would make my 2020 for sure we, we could wow. probably do that okay. well, i've got all the googly eyes you could ever need if you ever need googly eyes I can piggyback on this and speaking of going out, um, those Charleston girls, uh, we went out and we sang some karaoke uh, at uh, the Sticky Rice Bowl in DC when we were there in Lobby Day. It was the last time I've actually gone out to a public establishment with friends and uh, had an amazing night. Um, speaking of socks, they were cutting a rug on the dance floor. And so I'm sure that they get through a lot of socks uh with as much as they were tearing it up but 
it was a night I will never forget for sure. And uh, definitely it's awesome that you connected with them. What song did you sing? Yes. That is an important Well, uh, <laughs> so to elaborate on that story a little bit more fully, uh, Matt, who's my coworker from the Mid-Atlantic region, um, had kind of organized this thing and, and spread the word, you know, through the 150 people or whatever people that were participating. We got there and there wasn't, it was like the Charleston girls and Matt and I, and maybe a couple other stragglers. And the, the karaoke DJ was like, Hey, you know, if people don't start signing up and singing songs, I'm going to shut it down and it's going to be over. <laughs> And so we were, Matt and I were like, oh shit, like that, like he just threw down the challenge right there. And so Matt and I basically did a karaoke off, like serenading each other back and forth. And uh, like, I mean, it's like, what song didn't I sing that night? Uh, I do recall I, I got into, like, I had to keep it going and the, the DJ stopped playing and uh, I had done uh, Ween uh, bananas and blow and then it kind of just kept on rolling and somehow I got roped into Japanese cowboy uh, after that which I was falling on my face and then piss up a rope came on and so I had to sing that song and uh, like I did not know that I was going to get stuck like going three wing songs in a row uh, so if, if you know ween if you know those songs <laughs> it was a pretty classic moment and those those Charleston girls came up to me afterwards they're like that, uh, that bananas and blow, I kind of like that. Uh, where, where did that come from? Ween. That's an amazing story. <laughs> that is so classic. Oh my God. I mean, everybody talks about Vegas with hookers and blow. Now it's all about the bananas and blow. I'm in. Let's do this. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, <laughs> sharing is caring. It was a little, a little overshare there, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Letting it hang out. You know, but, you know, <laughs> Call, you are right. The community is pretty impressive. Like, you know, we went to the leadership conference, what, uh, last year down it's in like um, the, yeah, it feels like five years ago, definitely. I had a memory pop up from the, um, oh my gosh, nice, Brian. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's like I had the memory pop up for our, uh, West coast chapter back in 2017. So yeah, it still feels like, you know, five hour, 500 years ago, but no, you meet so many people from all the different chapters and they, we even had internet, like people from Australia at their leadership conference last year. And you just really get an opportunity to make those connections and kind of do that cross promotion or the cross training. Like, what are you guys doing? You know, I, we, I met other people from other chapters who are like, well, this is what we're trying to do to build our membership base. Oh, that's a great idea. What are you guys doing? Well, we're doing this and stuff like that. Um, and I still am talking to these people on a personal level. Like you make friends and, you know, I'm not trying to, it sounds like I'm doing the sorority rush thing here, but, um, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, it's, you are all coming together for that common goal of wanting to do something and save, you know, our beaches and oceans and planet and all that good stuff. And just a really good, solid group of people. That's all I can say. Agreed. You're here. And how. So the final last part of that story is that we successfully held it down. Um, we got reinforcements who came in. Greg Long actually came out as well, uh, along with Cliff Capono and like, you know chad's there and like you know i mean it was like it, it went on and and a lot of the people still had like a, a high level congressional hearing to perform, to attend the next morning uh but it, it was like epic night uh ended up doing sweet caroline with a, a guy from north carolina chapter he was like i've been waiting all night to sing this song uh, Ryan Cruz, the youth coordinator, and I uh, tag team for a little brandy. Uh, so it was it was epic. I, I, I don't know how, call you you didn't find your way that night, but uh, <laughs> I think you were eating oysters. 
Dude, I think I was. This is like of all, oh my gosh. I mean, maybe my biggest surf rider regret reflecting on the last <laughs> few years was missing, somehow missing that night. Because I think I was with all of them earlier. I think we we went and got Ethiopian somewhere. And, and then, yeah, I think I had an oyster engagement elsewhere. That'd be a great icebreaker. What's your biggest surf rider regret? <laughs> that's that's a good one. <laughs> Oh yeah, I guess I just spilled the beans on that one. Why don't we not joining an EC earlier? <laughs> nice. <laughs> I do, you know what? My biggest regret is not going on that day on the hill. I admit. So. Nice. No right. regrets. It's all good. There'll be many more opportunities. Got that right. There, 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 there will be. Oh, yeah. I mean, air fryers are super cheap if anybody's looking right now. Trust me. No, I've got my air fryer to the Bay Area for $136 round trip. It's like Alaska's like, please fly. Oh, yeah, because I went to Keep Atlanta. Been free. Go to Florida. It's fine. Right. No, because I went to Atlanta last month and it was only $400 round trip nonstop. Perfect. I was like, this is ridiculous. No. So. <laughs> They're just not serving booze on the flights. That's all that's, so FYI. <laughs> Make sure you BYO straw so you can like drink all your beverages like under your mask. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I would love to bring like a big metal straw and put like a little like airplane liquor bottle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not that I would do that. That's, that's my plan. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, um, I don't want to go too far past time here, um, but if anyone has any actual questions <laughs> or anything, we're, we're here for you. <laughs> All right, we could probably stories. Welcome I'm in stories. I have a couple of stories from the, um, the big party they had in, in Los Angeles for the 25th anniversary, where I was, I was a volunteer there, but afterwards there was a after party where there was a live band playing, again, karaoke, a live band playing um, karaoke, but it, but it was very particular in that it was Green Day, only Green Day. Oh. <laughs> Just a Green Day cover band, that's, that's new, I haven't seen that. Yeah, it was, it was quite an experience itself. So, for another time, perhaps. <laughs> I don't sing karaoke, but I've been to heavy metal karaoke. That is a lot of fun with the live band. Freaking amazing. Sounds aggressive. <laughs> it, and it was in Atlanta of all places. You know, I was like, what? Where, I found myself in some kind of underground thing. Well, let me rephrase that. But it's like, you know, it was like just kind of crazy. Um, but nonetheless, you just have this moment like, I'm in Atlanta, you know, one of the most conservative places in the world. And suddenly I'm doing, you know, watching drag queens sing heavy metal karaoke to a live band. Okay, I oh. like it. Yeah, that was great. Well, I, I guess what we've established is we, we, uh, we had Surfrider likes karaoke, so. <laughs> <laughs> Which we'll resume in 2022. Yeah, yeah. exactly, right? <laughs> hey, Drew, there's our fundraiser. <laughs> yes. Heavy metal karaoke. <laughs> I know karaoke. <laughs> I, I just realized that this is being recorded. So, Liz, yeah. uh, do you think you can edit out some of the, the stuff that was a little bit PG? Yeah, I'll, I'll edit out your story and share it. <laughs> yeah, you know, for sure. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm fully going to save that and be like, hey. <laughs> I, have stand, to. I stand behind it. You know, it was, it was solid outreach there. Um, no. <laughs> I need to get the <laughs> guys, gals' emails from call and see if I can, if there's any like footage of this event, this so-called. I have some pictures. Uh, those those of us who were were there, um, you know, and, and I can definitely say that Greg Long did. Uh, we didn't start the fire, and it was like nailed it to a T. It was the most amazing karaoke song I've ever seen in my life. The guy will forever be a legend in my book for his big wave antics but his karaoke skills he's got some game so <laughs> if you're gonna go with that song you better nail it like that's a risky move right there tough one yes i feel like this is the second time you've asked to have it edited out 
Some, some, uh, this, I don't know why uh, this keeps happening. Truth be told, Brianna, uh, I, I pretty much ask for that every time. <laughs> well, he does. That is shit. I get old, you know, the filter goes away, and, you know. <laughs> From, yeah. oh. You're an inspiration, Gus. Hey, y'all are an inspiration, and it's great to see you. Thank you all so much for all that you do. Work on your karaoke because we're going to get it together when it gets normal again. <laughs> Bring it. Oh, yeah. Can we, can we hack into the, like, chapter net and, like, the EC requirements and be like, also, you must submit your karaoke song. I've and never done karaoke. What? Yeah, I've done it, like, know. once in my life. I know. You know, the backup I know. Singer. Hey, Brie, I did it once. I was a backup singer, and that's it. <laughs> I feel like at this point it's kind of like a badge I wear, you know, like I have, I'm the only one that hasn't done it kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> like if you're playing Never Have I Ever, like that always just flows. Yeah. So <laughs> just to put a, a pin in this, well, not to quit the discussion, but I do think that next month's um, icebreaker question definitely be what is your go to karaoke song? Absolutely. So we've got that covered. <laughs> what about Drew? Since we've done like trivia and some other games, is there a way to do karaoke on Zoom? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, right now. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I'm sure there's someone's thought of something. Let's <laughs> blow it out on in November for uh <laughs> we, we might scare people away. <laughs> given given like the audio echo issues in like a normal like five person meeting, I could see it going really well. Even everybody forgetting they're on mute might. Kind of... uh, exactly. <laughs> Just be like, this is the worst shit I've ever heard. Wait, oh, no, not on mute. <laughs> we, we pulled off Pictionary. No <laughs> I don't know about karaoke. <laughs> so. Maybe air guitar. Yeah, we could do that. <laughs> we could do like air instruments, like pick an instrument and like charade it. Mine's the egg shaker. Ocarina. <laughs> Lamb. Nice. Great to see everybody. Cool. All right, guys. Thanks Cheers. for coming by. Thank you all. Well, thanks all who attended. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. See ya.